know that putting your shopping cart back where you found it in the shopping cart bin area is one small step that you can do on your way to being a better person. But now it's getting a little trickier. How about whether or not you might run into a burning building to save people? Hmm. That is a tough moral question to try to answer that has many different nuances and layers. And that's what we're going to be getting into and more in week two of our book club here on the Painted Porch. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Amy Yakowski. I'm the founder of Painted Porch Strategies, and I'm here with my wonderful crack team, Sierra Ram Cantrell and Rob Hunter. And we are covering for the month of April, we are reading How to Be Perfect by Michael Shore. Michael Shore is the creator and writer of The Good Place. And through his journey of writing that series, he dove into moral philosophy and thought, why not try to put it in a book and share it with people so that way they can get a little bit of an introduction and an understanding of what it might take to be a quote unquote good person. So as I said, up until now, part one, we focused on some pretty light things. He introduced us to the big three Western philosophies that we're focusing on in this book, which is virtue ethics from Aristotle, we have utilitarianism from John Stuart Mill and deontology from Immanuel Kant. In addition, he threw in a couple of other isms in there, which was contractualism, what we owe to each other, and the African idea of Ubuntu, which is we are who we are because of one another. So that was part one. Part one was pretty easy. There was the easy answer of, well, of course we should do that because we're decent people and decent people want to try to help one another out. But now we're getting into some deeper, some bigger matters here that are a lot more nuanced. They are not as black and white and they're not as easily gut checked in the good person or bad person boxes that we might fall within. He starts by asking us, should I run into a burning building and try to save everyone trapped inside? That's a big question to ask and to contemplate. And really what he's trying to explain here and present is having us understand or start to think about how we should or how we may react in what otherwise might be extreme situations where even applying some of our basic rules of good, bad, uh, might be a little bit more nuanced. So right out the gate, Sierra Rob, what were your first thoughts of when you first read this? Maybe what was even your initial gut check of would I do that? Would I run into a burning building to save people? Well, it's always interesting when you, you know, as actors would say, like raise the stakes, right? And a burning building, that, that's about as big of a stake as, as like would come to mind. Um, you know, I, I think oftentimes we learn a lot about humanity when these big extreme things happen. You know, 9-11 comes to mind as far as the reaction of the heroicism by a lot of regular people on that day um, through a lot of tragedy. A lot of people really just went for it and, and, you know, went to go do the right thing, even if it meant losing their life or becoming very ill. Um, it's sort of like uh, extreme philosophy. <laughs> Mm. like a big ex extreme <laughs> yeah, yeah extreme <laughs> i mean these are the, the big questions i mean most of us never will face that in our lives but that's the whole idea we brought up last week if you caught our video in part one is really that the philosophical training of kant is to be ready in my opinion for those big moments the big question about that is do you know what to do in a burning building situation and if you don't don't go in that would be my advice. So if you're just like, I'm just going to run in the building, there's a lot of factors. There's smoke inhalation, there's heat. Maybe you don't know what's inside. You know, there's all kinds of different variables in it. So I always come back to that answer. It depends. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's what he talks about here. I, I love how 
at least with this, he he looks at it through the three core lenses and he's like, okay, well, what would Kant say to this? And with Kant and deontology, he would say, you know what, there are no extreme situations because you have a universal maxim and always true way that you behave, regardless if it's an ant's, you know, walking across the concrete or if it's a bunch of people in a burning building, whatever your maxim is, it applies the same. Now, the kicker is it really depends on what maxim you've derived, right? So if your maxim is, I will do everything I can to save people that are in distress, then yes, then the maxim goes, yes, you're going to run into a burning building or you're going to hold a kid's hand while you cross the street. But... If your maxim is slightly different, it's all in the way you shape it, which I think is interesting because I, even within the deontology, you can shape your maxims. It's being mindful about the maxims that you create, but not making them so general or so broad that you're really not following any type of moral compass whatsoever with it. Yeah. Now they did throw in a few other curveballs too. He talked a little bit about Ayn Rand and how yeah. it was like, opposite it was like the maxim was everything for myself self first right then there was a brief shout I don't want to say shout out because that's not totally right but they brought up the stoics which if you're familiar with us out here on painted court strategies we are rooted in stoic philosophy but as he makes the distinction we are at the stoic with a capital s which is following the teachings of Marcus Aurelius um, with Zeno um, there's also the lowercase s stoic, which is usually meant to mean more of like less emotion in, with the lowercase s. Yeah, I don't even know that it's because it, we all have our emotions. It's just what do you do with those emotions? Mm -hmm. And I don't think his reading on Ayn Rand is actually accurate at all. I think he misses the main point because I think Ayn Rand talks about the idea of individual freedom that allows you to determine if you're going to run into the burning building or not. She doesn't say you shouldn't. She just says it's really up to you. And whether I do or not shouldn't judge whether or not I'm a good person because of all those factors. We take a complex situation, a burning building, and make it seem like it's a simple choice. Well, it's not that simple because of all those factors. Mm -hmm. So that's my main issue with, with part two is... If we want to jump into this right now, or we jump? want to wait. Oh, Amy's not supposed to jump. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that my, my main issue with Michael Schur here is I get the impression he thinks he's better than most people because he's, he, the main focus of this part is his then fiance, now wife, got into a little fender bender. So she bumped into a car, caused damage. So the guy in the car gave him an estimate. It was like 836 bucks, I think was the number. Mm -hmm. And he was like, what the hell? I, this is ridiculous. Uh, and it was happened to be during Hurricane Katrina, which Amy and I actually lived through. We were there during Hurricane Katrina. So he equated the two. How do you care about your bumper when people are drowning? And I'm like, okay, first of all, and he admits that he took this out of control because he made this a big thing and he, shamed the guy publicly so the whole lesson i'm supposed to learn is not to shame people publicly but then he shames like five or six different groups of people in the chapter i thought that was really disappointing and it's actually changed my entire opinion about michael Schur trying to be a good person i'm like you're defeating your own arguments in this chapter because he makes these i'm very political I work in politics, I cover politics for a living. I won't get into it here, but he makes these very vague throwaway, throwaway lines that are just not even accurate. And he's almost judging you if you don't agree. So to him, it seems like to be a good person, you have to agree with him politically. And I was just incredibly disappointed in that. He is a comedy writer. So it's one of the things that occurs to me throughout this book, part, our part one and our part two is, He's used to like kind of having a pithy, a pithy take, right? And I feel like a lot of it is written like as a comedy writer would write it. But you're right. It's not, it's not a factual, here's the types of philosophy. It's definitely his 
pithy opinion about such issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's where I think, you know, we were talking about this last night and I said that in some ways, I think illuminates the, the beauty and the struggle of philosophy, of moral philosophy. That's why there's so many different isms that are out there that people have come up with uh, because they can agree and they all have different ways of viewing it. You have Kant with his very extreme universal maxims. Nope, you create the rule, you follow the rule. I damn it, you follow that rule to the end, but make sure you're really smart with how you create that rule so you don't, you don't violate your own virtues or your own mor morality that you're trying to follow. And then you have utilitarianism that says, listen, it's all about the, the best outcomes for the most people, which can take it to a very big extreme. You know, he talks about even here the idea of happiness punk and being a, a moral saint. And those people are truly miserable, I would say, in their own in their own realities, but it's also unattainable. You know, the, in, in The Good Place, there's this character that they talk about, and he mentions in the book to Doug Forsett. And Doug Forsett, he says, is guilty of this utilitarian, what he calls the happiness pump, basically. And they, all he does is he puts everybody else's happiness in front of his own to his own detriment, where he gets bullied, where he's malnourished. It's all these things. So that way, everybody else is experiencing their best lives, regardless of Doug and what Doug is suffering on a day to day basis. And then along with that, you know, we all we have Aristotle and his virtue ethics. Personally, I'm very biased. I, I'm, I'm a fan of virtue ethics because stoicism is a variation of virtue ethics. I think it provides the best, um, one of the better blueprints for how to design your life because it's not so much focused on what you do, but who you want to be and how you want to behave, not the actual like, do I run into a burning building or not? So I think that's, well, well, there's definitely some instances here where he seems to be violating his his own teachings that he's providing. It also reminds you that he is a fallible human and he is very much still trying to figure this out himself. And he is going, just like all of us, he's going to be just as guilty of tripping over yourself, tripping over himself in one hand saying, well, you know what, we should be able to flex and have the ability to have intellectual free will and make choices that benefit us, but then say, but then the idea of, you know, objectivism or Ayn Rand, she's a monster and she's a terrible person and no one should be like that, you know? <laughs> that was yeah, little... I, I found him to be was... judgmental. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that was the part that when I look at moral philosophy, it is lessening your judgments. And that's one of Marcus Aurelius's one of our main stoic teachers whole entire point is that people make decisions based on where they're at, based on their experiences. It doesn't necessarily make them good or bad. It just makes them make that decision in that moment. So I think that he doesn't go deep enough. And I think he tries to make these really lame, shallow political points, maybe because he's a comedy writer, maybe because he obviously leans one way politically versus another, but it seems to castigate anyone who disagrees with him on any political issues. And the issues he brings up are like electric cars, fossil fuels, which go hand in hand. He mentions one politician in particular. He gets into vaccines, he gets into masks. Mm -hmm. And that's the part where I'm like, dude, you lost me. Because not only do I... Uh, most of what he has written has been disproven by now. So he, I don't even know why he even bothered to do that because it, it took away from all of his main arguments for me. And now I'm just walking away like, okay, now I, and I love the good place and I love Brooklyn nine, nine. I love the projects he's worked on, but I have a different opinion of him now. So now he's forced me to judge him, <laughs> which I didn't really want to do. The but it's is because I felt like he was judging me. Mm -hmm. And I was I... like, incredibly like, oh, okay. So he didn't necessarily write this book for everybody. He wrote this book for people who think like him. Well, to that end, Rob, you know, you, you talk about how now you are judging him 
because of the judgments that it seems that he has passed on to not you directly, but through some of the th- uh, the comedic throwaway pits, right? Being very they were funny. funny. The singers, yeah. Sing. You know, trying to get those yeah. batches. You know, very Joan Calamezzo of him. Batches in there. <laughs> But but with that, it's interesting because the situation that really started this whole journey for him was that car bumper situation and the basically the shaming that he inadvertently, he didn't realize initially, but ultimately came to realize the shaming that he was creating and putting on this poor, innocent guy who just had his bumper dinged. And it's interesting because he talks about within it that there is this idea that shame, you know, shame is a very powerful weapon that can sometimes be used for good to check people's bad behavior. But he does specifically mention in here that it can have the opposite effect. So, you know, you can try to, in small ways, in little zingers that are throwaway statements, you can try to compel people to behave better, behave good through shame and make them feel guilty. But a lot of times it can have that opposite effect, just like you, Rob, where now you're you're looking at him and I can hear every time, sit and read together on the couch and he's just like, oh, oh, oh. And he's just like, <laughs> well, because I felt like because, he was shaming people yes. after admitting the shaming this guy. And he wrote this book and created the good place based on that story. So he's made millions of dollars off of this and he's still shaming people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what's the lesson? The lesson is you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. So you're shaming people you disagree with. He mentions bankers in the book and they're monsters, but doesn't even explain what he means by that. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm like, okay, this is, yeah. like I said, I'm just disappointed. Well, I'm going to say that's where stoicism has an edge and he's not covering stoicism in this. Maybe he needs to. He might want to, he might want to visit a little bit of stoicism because stoicism puts a very uh, heavy focus on the idea of what you label as good and bad and whether you're labeling the person or a particular behavior and how you are actually judging another person and that judgment and, and how it's impacting the way you interact with other people and whether or not you are even willing, able, or open to seeing other people's perspectives. And that's where I feel he runs short, at least in this section, is he's very short, yes. Well, I always have to wonder, I'm always like, are they setting us up for a plot twist? I mean, oh, mm-hmm. maybe this is a setup. Maybe, maybe he's going to all of a sudden, like in the next section, he's going to be like, so did you find yourself judging me for blah? I mean, you know, maybe I've watched too many like movies with a plot twist, but I'm like, maybe he's doing it on purpose. Oh, kind of setting you up to catch you, to catch you in your judgments. I'll only agree if he actually admits that he shames people in this after admitting he shouldn't shame people. If he does that, then fine. He'll turn the corner for me. But I don't get the impression mm-hmm. based on his thinking, particularly politically. Because, again, you know, I live and breathe politics every day. This was not the book. I, I didn't expect it to be political, to mm-hmm. make all these little political throwaway lines. So that, I think, is is misleading, even though I know that there's a moral component to politics. But I happen to think the exact opposite of him in so many ways about what makes you know, politics, moral and, and not. So, I, and I don't think he goes deep enough at all. I don't think he looks, he just goes surface level on so many issues that are so complicated. Well, and I think we're going to get more into that probably in part three, because it, he does, in The Good Place, he does present that, that, that example of how deep do you take it to your level of goodness? Because in The Good Place, uh, whether you've seen it or not, you know, again, encourage you to watch it, regardless of Rob's opinion of the book. <laughs> well, I, I love The Good Place. Yes. And I would highly recommend that yes. you watch it. His work is very good. He's yes. a very good artist, there's mm-hmm. no doubt about it. Yeah, but in The Good Place, one of the big, the whole premise is that there's a point system. And uh, for every good deed that you do, you get so many points. And for every bad, 
thing you do, you get negative points. It reduces your, your, your bank, right? Which we'll even get into more in a minute here. But in towards the latter part of the series, there's one part where there is a judge and she's like the universal being judge. And she has a very black and white view of what is good and what is not good. And she ends up going down to earth to kind of just feel things out. And she realizes that her intention of doing this one good thing actually had this massive cascading effect of all of these negative things, which then created a realization of it is almost impossible to do good all the time. In fact, that's even what Michael Schur talks about. He talks about the idea of being a moral saint and always doing the, always thinking about morality all the time and it's impossible and we actually are going we experience exhaustion we can't get too much you know it's there's too much going on in our personal lives with our families our friends our jobs you know to then have to also think about all the time well what's my bank are they monsters are they contributing to uh to climate change um you know what's going on yes, in the Ukraine? Answers, yes. it's like you can't <laughs> think about all those things all the time but what you can do is set some basic guideposts for yourself and be able to not only define what those guideposts are of what what you believe will make you a good person or not, but also have those guideposts to check yourself when you start to get a little too far to one side or a little too far to the other, you know, finding that golden mean, which I love because he even talks about the burning building. It's like from, from an, a virtue ethics, from an Aristotle view, um, you know, a, a a purely wholly 100% courageous person would bust into that building and just not even think for a second, come hell or high water, I'm going in without any plan. <laughs> and who knows whether or not they'll make it better or worse. Whereas the coward, they're the other extreme and they're just gonna sit there on the sidelines wringing their hands and whimpering. And he's, he, I love how he uses the example of when it comes to finding that golden mean, it's not a seesaw, it's not an either or, it's a tug of war. And sometimes with courage, you need a little bit of cowardice to bring you back to the middle, to bring you back to that center. And sometimes with cowardice, you need a little bit more extreme courage, moments of courage to bring you back to that center. And I loved that idea of that tug of war because you're constantly at a tug of war with yourself about what, what, what can I do to be a good person and what, if any, particular moral philosophy or combination of philosophies do I want to apply in my life to help check myself day in and day out? And yeah, I love that point because it's super complex. So he, he kind of wraps up this section by talking about his bank and he didn't want to change banks because it was a lot of work. And he admits that it was a lot of work when he did change his bank, but he somehow makes himself look like a better person than you because he did the work because his bank's full of monsters without defining what that actually means. So, okay, that's where I felt like he's super judgy, which is the exact opposite point of the entire book to me. So I hope to Sierra's point that he does come around and say, ha ha, I got you. Because if not, I'm going to be like, dude, I got some retorts, which is the whole point of philosophy. So Maybe well, one day, Michael Scherer will come on the porch and have a debate with us. Consider the source is that I'm the eternal optimist, so maybe I just hope that he's setting us up. <laughs> maybe he really is this judgy. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, he does full on admit it. He says, he talks about his core faults. Let's see. He says that his worst faults are impatience, recklessness, excessive bluntness, emotional extremes, and vindictiveness. So That's called being human. So, yeah. That so, let, but, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time exploring, you know, where we are not seeing congruency in what he's saying sometimes and then other times. But I want to take a few minutes, Sierra, to talk about something that I know is very near and dear to your heart is our mindfulness Sherpa, because he does bring up this idea of mindfulness in Buddhism and the Buddhist monk, I'm going to get his name right, I know it, Take Not Han. 
Uh, he's the Buddhist monk, and he has written a lot about the idea of mindfulness in Buddhism. And bringing that in as another variation of a moral philosophy and finding that balance of why you're doing what you're doing or what would make you a good person. So I want to hear some of your thoughts on that because I know that I, I, I'm sure your little ears like perked up. You're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, th that is a, an interesting philosophy. And I know last week I was saying too that there, there's always this interesting cross section between morality and philosophy and religion. The, these things are going to intersect. So, you know, I always say you can be more than one thing. So you're not always a perfect fit. But, but one of the interesting things about Buddhism is a lot of people think about Buddhism, they think about Buddhists believe in reincarnation, and that there is a karma that's not necessarily from this lifetime, this body that you embody. But another thing that I think is interesting to note is Buddhism is based on this idea that the world is suffering. The world is about suffering. And if you can just accept that as the truth, then things will be a lot easier on you that you just, it is about suffering. It's not about being happy and being elated and everything being cupcakes and rainbows, as my son Colt would say, it's <laughs> that there is suffering. And when you understand that, when you talk about Buddhism from an awareness standpoint, it's that how can you be aware of suffering and ideally aware of other people's suffering as a way of you showing compassion to other people's suffering and not only being consumed in your own. Now, I, I'm not going to give you all of Buddhism in a nutshell, but that's something that I think is interesting is it because uh, what I've gotten from all of this section is stuff's complicated. <laughs> I've learned this in life too. Things are complicated. It's not always black and white. It's not always obvious, but if you can at least bring some of that awareness of other people's suffering or other people's feelings to help you decide on what to do. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And I love the tie in when he introduced uh, take not Han and his, his, the thank, thank you. That's practice. It's like it takes practice, it does. <laughs> um, but with take not Han and, and the idea of mindfulness, the way he introduced it was with this concept of what he calls moral dessert. And it's not cupcakes <laughs> in that regard. It's not that type of dessert. It's whether or not you deserve recognition for the moral thing that you did which i absolutely love because this is something that i struggle with a lot um he, he uses the example of tipping <laughs> which is so funny uh where he says you know i every day i go to starbucks i get a coffee it's a certain amount there's i always pay cash there's a certain there's about 25 cents worth of chain and i always make sure to tip the barista but I wait to put the change in the jar until the barista can see me doing it. All 27 cents. So that way the barista knows, hey dude, I got you. Here you go. Here's a tip. So it's like, go me, that moral dessert. Look at me. I'm doing good. That makes me feel good because they saw that I did something good. It, you know, it, it ticks off a good person box. Um, and also it potentially makes the other person feel good as well because they see that I'm acknowledging and thanking them for getting me a coffee. And so he introduces the mindfulness component saying that, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, you don't do it for the moral dessert. You're, you do it because you do it, <laughs> because it's the, you know, so I don't know if you had any further thoughts on that, Sierra, that you wanted to talk about. Like, uh, you know, yeah. it, that, that part was definitely like a comedic bit, you know, mm -hmm. I can see the comedy writing there. Um, but he is, he, he, it's, it's sort of like the, you know, do you volunteer at a soup kitchen just so you can take a selfie of yourself volunteering at the soup kitchen, or do you actually do it because you want to help at the soup kitchen? So yeah. it's kind of 
has to do with motive or intention or how, however you want to look at it. But I think that's always important. Just ask yourself, like, what is my motivation? Uh, why, what is my intention here? Because there's more than one way to achieve your goal. And so I think, I think when you actually do, deep, deep dive into it, it does, you know, with the, the change, is he actually doing that because he wants to give that to the barista? Or is he, is he doing it because he wants the barista to think he's, he's tipping and, and what's the purpose here? You know, and, and you could ask by the same means, like you could get complicated. Well, did you know that all the tips go into a tip pool and then they all split it up? You know, if you really want to thank that one specific barista, is there a different way to do it that impacts that specific barista as opposed to 27 cents thrown into a, a kitty, so to speak? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just complicated. It's all complicated. Mm-hmm. Well, and that, and that's why I love that he, you know, again, he, he approaches it from those, those different philosophical perspectives. Again, like what is your motivation? Are you doing it to be seen as a good person? Are you doing it because being seen makes you feel like a good person? And that's where he introduces even William James, which they called the, mo- the, the father of modern philosophy, he introduced this idea of pragmatism. And he said, who cares? Because in the end, you know what? Michael felt good for giving the tip. The other person felt good for being seen. There was money in the pool at the end of the day. Who cares? Ultimately, the end was the same. So the means, how you got there, does it really matter? But I, I, I struggle with this, with this moral dessert piece, because, you know, I, on the porch, we we have set up where 5% of all sales go to some sort of charity, but we're not broadcasting that per se. We're not saying, look at this charity. And we're not even doing it in our name. It's in whoever, it's, it's in the client's name or it's anonymous, right? Depending upon the sale. But then I struggle with this because as a business, you know, we are building a business. And a lot of what you do as a business is to build recognition and trust and a sense of shared, shared values or shared ideas, right? And so I often see on LinkedIn where people are posting like, oh, you know, here we are volunteering. We're, you know, packing boxes for something, you know, yay us. And on one hand, I'm like, well, you know what? It's, it, I, I struggle because I say that is setting a good example potentially. So people go, oh, you know what? They're doing something good. Maybe I should do something like that. I would actually, you know, that I, I know that there's a soup kitchen in my community that could use help. They're really struggling with food distribution right now. You've inspired me to do that. But on the same hand, I look at it and go, is this just self-promotion? Because, you know, I I volunteer a lot. I, I'm part of a junior league here in Phoenix. And we do a lot of volunteer work, but I don't post it because I don't, I, I struggle right. with, I, I don't want it to be about me, but at the same time, I recognize, well, sometimes by doing that, you are setting a good example. You're inspiring someone else to do something that they otherwise wouldn't have done. But it's definitely a struggle that I have. I, I, I tend to err more on the, I will do it anonymously. I'm going to do it privately. I don't want the recognition. But then if everybody is always doing things anonymously, there is a little bit of that like societal pressure, you, you know, to just do a, do a little bit, do a little bit. And when you see other people doing it, and let's say you're trying to compete with them, maybe for business or recognition, maybe it's a good thing to post or to share. And is it okay that you feel good about volunteering? I would say absolutely yes. Yeah, because I, I think that, Yeah, but I think that that's, that's giving back and you shouldn't feel good about that. So that next level is, okay, how do you rationalize? And if you're doing it, I want to show people I'm doing this. And if you make the message, hey, you know what? Here's how you can get involved Ooh. and you can show someone how to do it. So it's not, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's, hey, you know what, I did this, it makes me feel good. And this is the benefit for the people that are here. And this is how you can do it. That's great. If you want to, if you have any questions, you want to involve, you know, reach out to me. Mm -hmm. So if you make it about the other person that might Mm -hmm. be watching or seeing your content, I think that is how you 
put forth the best goodwill. All right. You've convinced me, Rob Hunter. <laughs> Occasionally, I can do that. 20 right. plus years of partnership. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so any final thoughts on part two? Yes. Of our Michael, I'm disappointed in your judgment, man. Let's have a debate. Come on the board. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Sierra, any other final thoughts or takeaways from this one? No, I'm, I'm curious where this is going to go in the last segment of this book. Um, it, it's been interesting. I, I think for me, I kind of glaze over in a few parts of this book. I'll be honest. Parts of it, I'm like, cool. And parts of it, I'm like. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that, too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Um, but I, 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 I think that it's important to can sometimes consume or listen to things that you don't agree with and listen to how that sits in your body. Because I think that if you can pause your own judgment for a minute, that sometimes you can find out something new or at least maybe grow a little patience, <laughs> stretch that, that patience muscle too. So I'm curious, I'm, I'm waiting to um, pass my final vote until after it's complete. Okay. So final thoughts, final takeaways will be in next week's <laughs> video. We'll see if Rob has just thrown up his hands and said, F I'm not even finishing this. <laughs> you, well, or, although I will be sharing some thoughts. So Amy, I will have do some. Do you have a beep button, Amy, just in case, in case <laughs> yeah. you sleep things I, out? I, I can work on that. I just make sure on YouTube it's labeled not for kids. <laughs> Explicit because of this guy. I suffer from those same maladies that he does. So, mm -hmm. yes, it, it is good. I, I like what you're saying, though, Sierra, is stretching the patient's muscle. I love to challenge my own thinking and my own perspective. But I don't I don't think he does that because he doesn't provide enough depth. Mm -hmm. So maybe he does in part three. Yeah. And it's also a, a wonderful way, Sierra, to your point, to be able to catch where your own judgments about his judgments might be just bristling you a little bit too much and, and, you know, work through that and explore that as well and say, why, why is this upsetting me so much? Why am I so agitated by this? Because he's wrong. <laughs> Factually wrong. <laughs> That's why. Uh, All right. I'm uh, out of here. Yeah. I'm going away. <laughs> Are you All right. Like <laughs> so, <laughs> so for, so for our much. final week, we're going to go to part three, quote, in which things get really tough, but we power through and complete our journeys, becoming perfectly virtuous and flourishing and deontologically pure, happiness generating super people. And also there's a chapter with some cursing in it, but it's for a good reason. <laughs> so, so, All right, cursing, I'm back cursing. in. Rob's back in. So <laughs> we hope, we would love to know your feedback on this as you've gone through it. Uh, any of your big takeaways that we either got completely wrong and you want to judge us on and tell us we were bad and you were good, and why, or vice versa. <laughs> so until then, thank you so much for joining us. We are Painted Port Strategies. We are a training and advisory team dedicated to helping you design your best life and work in your company and everywhere in between. So we hope to see you next week. Subscribe to stay on top of all the latest porch musings. And uh, if you want to join in on the conversation further, join our club community there's a link here right in the video so you can be a part of this and tell us all the ways that we got it wrong <laughs> so until then take care and have a wonderful week and continue to be a good person